So I'll go ahead and introduce Rick. A lot of you know Rick, and I'm sure that's the reason we've got over 30 people here. Is Rick is talking tonight. But uh, Rick and I go back a ways, not as far as some of you, but uh, I'm Bob Wells. I'm the president of the Audubon Society of Omaha. And he, Rick is going to speak to us tonight kind of as an extension of, a, of an advanced birding uh, situation or birding course um, uh, in anticipation of spring migration. So I'll let Rick go ahead and take it away. I think we've got everything going here. So go ahead, Rick. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Bob. I really appreciate it. And I apologize to everybody for the uh, technical no. difficulties here. Um, so, all right. Are you, I think you're not on mute yet, Bob. No, sorry, Rick. No, that's all right. This is the show. Okay, so for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Rick Schmid. Uh, I've been birding for over 50 years. I've been bird banding for about 25 years. Um, I am from Nebraska, uh, but now I live in Stillwater, Minnesota, and I'm really pleased to see that uh, some of my new friends uh, here in Minnesota are joining us tonight. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming out for that. I appreciate it. I am a previous board member and employee of Fontenelle Forest in Nebraska, and I'm also a previous board member and contractor to the Audubon Society of Omaha. So I do have some strong connections to Omaha and to ASO. I am, however, not a professionally trained ornithologist by any means. So I do welcome you uh, at any point during the conversation. Um, if I say something wrong, uh, something that you think isn't right, please uh, don't hesitate to correct me. Also, if you have questions at any point during the, the presentation, uh, just unmute yourself and ask or or type in the, in the comments um, and we'll try to get those answered as we go. A lot of the things we're gonna talk about kind of build on each other. So uh, if you get lost early on, uh, you wanna say something so uh, so it doesn't get worse, <laughs> worse down the line. We'll also have some time for question and answer at the end. And then lastly, uh, all the presentations in the, um, all of the photographs in the presentation are either mine or Phil Swanson's. And um, speaking of Phil Swanson, is Phil on tonight? I assume he probably is. I didn't see his name, but I'm guessing Phil is probably with us here somewhere today. I'm here. Hi, Phil. Thank you. You're welcome. This, this presentation, uh, so it was originally Phil's idea. Uh, one day, and he, he and I were out birding, and he said to me, wouldn't it be great uh, for us to do a presentation where we talked about all the differences, different parts of bird's anatomy and how they're useful in identification, you know, making identifications in the field. So um, I guess when he said we and us, what he meant was that I could use some of his photos. So um, the presentation um, is divided into four parts. And uh, as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to tell Phil's photos from mine because his are the good ones. So that'll be, uh, that'll be pretty obvious. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, part winging it is gonna be the first section of the presentation where we're going to talk about um, the wings of the birds and the feathers on the wings and how those are useful in identifying birds. We're gonna talk, up, talk about bringing up the rear, which is uh, uh, tail feathers and rumps and under tail coverts. We're gonna talk about bodybuilding where we're gonna discuss the uh, different parts of a bird's body. And then lastly, we'll talk about field marks that are found on the bird's head. So um, the, first, uh, the first area we're gonna talk about is the wing and the associated feathers uh, with the wing. Many th of the field marks that are mentioned in field guides uh, have to do with, uh, with feathers in the bird's wing. So things like you know, wing bars and primary extension and all those kinds of things that you read about in the field guide and you say, gee, I wonder what that means. Hopefully after tonight's uh, presentation, you'll, uh, you'll know. So uh, there are three major categories of wing coverts. And can you see my uh, mouse, my little arrow moving around there? Okay, coverts are the smaller feathers that cover the bird's wing. And they uh, are primarily used uh, to protect the other feathers, to protect the bones and muscles of the wings. And they also make the wing airtight so that um, the bird is able to fly. And the way they do that is they cover the gaps in the shafts of the feathers. So if you've ever held a feather in your hand, you know that there's like a, a part of the quill or the shaft, or actually it's called the rectrix, or the, um, excuse me, the um, uh, uh, rachis, the rachis that sticks out at the bottom of the feather. And all of those 
little shafts go into the feather up in here. And if these primary coverts weren't covering them, the wing wouldn't be airtight. The air would just flow through the shafts of those feathers. So um, we have the, um, the lesser covert coverts, which are up on the, like what we would call the shoulder or the front leading edge of the wing. Then there's one row of median coverts, which is just one row of small feathers right through this area. And then um, these are the greater coverts. There's the greater secondary coverts in here and the greater and the primary or greater primary coverts here. And we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail uh, on the next slide. And if you look at this flycatcher, you'll see that these little feathers all up in here right under my thumb are lesser coverts. This one row of feathers right through here with the buff tips are the median coverts. There's just one, one row of those. And then these are the secondary coverts here with the buff tips. And then these dark feathers out on the edge of the wing are the primary coverts. And these two, there's a feather right here and there's a feather right here. They're a bit larger and those are called the alula. So um, the greater coverts are, are these, sec these feathers in this section right here. And as I just kind of alluded to, the greater coverts are divided into two sections, the greater secondary coverts, which cover the secondaries, and the greater primary coverts, which cover the primaries. So the primaries and the secondaries are the, uh, prime, are the main feathers that the bird uses for flying. And the primaries start right here. You can see this feather that kind of has a whitish tip to it and then these outer ones don't. So the feathers out this way are the primaries and the feathers that go in this way are the secondaries. And depending on the family of bird or the type of bird that it is, what, what family it's in determines how many primaries and secondaries they have. So it's not the same for every, for every bird. So the way that they're numbered is they start with one in the middle. And so this is primary one, and then it goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, on out to however many it has. And then the secondaries start here with S1, and they are numbered inward. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And unless you're a bird bander, you don't really care so much about the, the numbers on the primaries and secondaries. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is because the three secondaries that are on the innermost part of the wing. So on this flycatcher, it's this one, this one, this one. And on this picture, it's S9, S8, and S7. Those three feathers are the tertials. And the reason the tertials are important is because when the bird folds its wing and it's perched, it's not flying, the, all of these feathers fold under and the tertials are the feathers that protect the wing. And those are the feathers that you see when you're looking at the perched bird. Those are the, the prominent feathers that you look at. So it's just kind of important to know that, those, that that's what those are. Okay, so um, I've got another view here, um, just, uh, just kind of from a different angle. And again, we see the lesser coverts here, we see the median coverts here, and we see the greater coverts here. And those are called the secondary coverts because for the most part, if you look at what they're covering, they're covering the secondaries. And then these are the primary coverts or the greater primary coverts, and they're covering the primaries. And this um, photo or this diagram also shows the tail feathers or the rectrices, and we'll talk about that when we get to that section of the presentation. So this slide is called um, Confusing Terminology, not because I'm going to clear up the confusion, but <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the confusion is. So depending on which field guides you're reading, depending on what literature you're looking at, what study you're reviewing, some of these terms are thrown out there and it's often not exactly clear what they mean. And sometimes it's just because nobody's ever told you what they mean. And sometimes it's because they don't use the terms the same way every time. So we're going to just spend just a quick second on this slide, a couple seconds. So the remages are the primaries, the secondaries, and the primary coverts. So if you go back, it's basically these feathers right in here. It's all of these. Secondaries, primaries, primary coverts. That's what remages are called. The rectrices are the tail feathers, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And if you put those all together, the remages plus the rectrices, that's what's sometimes referred, referred to as flight feathers. And you'll, you'll hear that term and see that term in field guides. Those are the feathers that are primarily responsible for helping the bird fly because they create the lift and the drag and they create the, you know, the ability to navigate, they use their wings and their tails to help them stop and, and turn. So those are the flight feathers. 
As I mentioned, the tertials are the innermost three secondaries. And then the thing that's confusing, at least it's always been very confusing to me, is the term secondary coverts. Because as we talked about on the previous two slides, sometimes the term secondary coverts means the lesser, median, and greater coverts. So in other words, just these. Just those three sets of feathers is called, and it even says that there, secondary coverts, lesser, median, greater. And sometimes it's just a synonym for the greater secondary coverts, or sometimes they're just called the greater coverts, which are just this, it's just this row of feathers. That row of feathers right there is, is the greater secondary coverts, and sometimes they're just called secondary coverts. And then the greater coverts technically includes the secondary coverts and the primary coverts. So this whole uh, strip of feathers. So again, I, this wasn't going to clear up any confusion, I don't think. It's just going to point out the fact that depending on what book you're looking at, it can be very confusing. And sometimes you really kind of have to stop and think, oh, when they say secondary coverts, what are they really talking about? Are they just talking about the greater secondary coverts? Or are they talking about all of them? So just, just kind of a warning there. So now the question is, what difference does it make? Why is any of this important? How can I use this in the field? And our first, the first example that I have uh, involves cuckoos. Uh, most of the birds we're going to be looking at tonight as examples are birds that are going to be showing up here in the next two or three or four weeks, depending on where you live. Later for us up in Minnesota, sooner for you in Nebraska. And so here we have yellow-billed cuckoo, yellow coo yellow cuckoo, which does actually have a yellow bill most of the time, and black-billed cuckoo. But uh, sometimes the bill color is difficult to see. And a really good a field mark for these birds is in the primaries. And if you look at the yellow-billed cuckoo here, you'll see that these big feathers on top are the tertials, like we talked about, the ones that cover the wing. These are the secondary coverts. These are the primary coverts. And you'll see that the primary coverts and the outer couple of secondary, or the, excuse me, these are the tertials. These are the secondaries. These are the primaries, I'm sorry. The outer edge of the primaries has a rusty color to it. The outer edge of the outer secondaries right in here has a rusty color to it. So in the field guide, it'll say, look for rusty edging on the primaries. And that's a field guide for the yellow-billed cuckoo. The black-billed cuckoo does not have this rusty edging on the primaries. Um, it's got kind of an olive, an olive brown color to it. And, and usually if the bird is perched or in flight, you can see that rust in the wings of the yellow-billed cuckoo. All right, any questions about anything so far? All right, we're gonna go through a couple more examples here of, of uh, how, wing, how the wing field marks can help you identify the birds. These are two uh, terns that we see in both um, Nebraska and Minnesota on migration. This is a common tern. This is a forester's tern. The forester's tern is, <laughs> despite the name, uh, the forester's turn is a lot more common than the common turn in the area where we live. The common turn, and uh, these are some really pretty photographs. I think the forester's turn is Phil's, very nice photograph, Phil. These are some really beautiful photographs of the birds in flight with their wings frozen in time. The unfortunate thing is that when you're looking at these birds in real life out in the field, they don't stop like this in midair, they don't hover. So it's more difficult to know if you're looking at the top side of the wing or the underside of the wing. So that's the first thing. You have to make sure you're looking at the top side of the wing. And then what you'll see on the common turn is that these outer primaries, especially these outer five primaries, have black tips and they have a lot of gray in them, where on the top side of the Forster's turn, the primaries are all white. Now the undersides have this black in them. So again, when the bird is flapping really fast, sometimes you, it takes a minute to figure out if you're looking at the underside or the top side. But if you get a good look at the top side of the wing and you can see this gray and black, it's common turn. And if it's all white, it's Forrester's turn. Um, Black-throated blue warbler is a, an uncommon migrant, uh, both, both uh, in Nebraska and in Minnesota. But a lot of the uh, field guides will talk about the white handkerchief is, is the term that's often used in the field guides, the little white patch that both the males and females have um, on their wing. And the best photo I could find um, to show that, uh, or the best picture was actually from a field guide, was, uh, was the best one to that I could find to show it on the mail. Um, and what the point of this is that it's important where that white is, because if the white that you're seeing on the bird is up higher in the wings on the lesser coverts or the median coverts or the secondary coverts, 
it's probably not a black-throated blue warbler because the white patch on a black-throated blue warbler is in the primaries. It's at the very base of the primaries. And if you're looking at a male, probably not gonna be too difficult to identify. But if you're looking at a female, and as you can see in this beautiful photo by Phil Swanson, when you first look at this, you might think orange crown warbler, you might think Tennessee warbler, until you see that white patch. And again, the white patch is not a wing bar, which we'll talk about in a second. It's right at the base of the primaries. So being able to distinguish the coverts from the primaries themselves is helpful in identifying this bird. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk a little bit about is uh, something that's called primary extension. And this is a term that's used um, in field guides and it's especially useful for the impidinex flycatchers, the willow, the alder, the least, and the acadian. We're gonna look at least and acadian here. Uh, and one of the things that can be confusing sometimes is primary extension is not the same as wing length. So the length of a bird's wing is from the, what we would call the wrist or the carpal bend of the ring wing, which is up here, all the way to the tip of the longest primary. That's how you measure the length of the wing of a bird. And a bird can have a very short or long wing, and it can also have a very short or long primary extension because the primary extension is the amount or the distance, the length that the primaries extend beyond the secondaries. So on this Acadian flycatcher on the right side, these are the, these are the tertials, one, two, three. These are the secondaries. And if you count, there are about six of them. And then right here are the primaries. So the primary extension, which is one of the field marks you use to identify these birds, is the length that these primary feathers stick down below these secondary feathers. And as you can see here, this, the length of these primaries as it sticks down here, oh, sorry, as it sticks down here is about the length, almost the length of this part of the wing. The, this extension is, is about, about as long as those secondaries. On the least flycatcher, these are the, this is the bottom of the secondaries right here. And what you can see is that where the primaries extend down is not very far at all. It's a very short primary extension. And if you look at the length of this, it's probably maybe only like half the length of the secondaries. So it doesn't have anything to do with how long the wing is. It has to do with how far the primaries stick out below the secondaries. And if you don't know the difference between primaries and secondaries, you really can't tell. I mean, you really don't have a way to measure or to gauge whether you have a long primary extension or a short primary extension. On, on these particular birds, when I'm personally, when I'm birding in the field, if if the bird doesn't call, if it's an impidinax flycatcher and it doesn't call, I look at the eye ring and I look at the primary extension. And if it's a really super short primary extension um, and it's a pretty heavy eye ring, I'll usually call it a least flycatcher. And if it's an Acadian flycatcher, it also has a heavy eye ring. It'll have a very long primary extension and it'll be kind of greenish. If you're looking at willow and alder flycatchers, their primary extension is between these two somewhere and their eye ring is quite variable. And if I've got one that I can't specifically call least or Acadian, if I think it's a willow or an alder and it doesn't sing, I don't call it. I just call it a unknown impidinex flycatcher. That's just, that's my own personal, um, the, my own personal uh, way of doing it. So, all right, moving along. Um, when we're talking about waterfowl, the, the section of the secondaries that is often brightly colored. So for example, in this mallard, you uh, see right here, these uh, blue feathers. That is often in field guides called the speculum, which is the Latin word for mirror. So it's like a bright reflective color patch. And that is actually in the secondaries. Those are secondary feathers right there uh, that are blue. And in the gad wall, you'll see that they are mostly white. So those are good field marks for those two birds. Oops, hold on here. Whoops. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> All right, sorry. 
Okay, so moving along, I mean, my uh, my uh, computer uh, tools got con got me confused there. So the next thing we're going to talk about now that we've talked about speculum, specula. One one speculum is a speculum. Two is a specula. It's a Latin word. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is wing bars and wing patches. So uh, it, especially when you're identifying sparrows and sometimes warblers, uh, one of the prime field marks that you'll look for is does the bird have a wing bar or not? And I'm sure all of you have, have heard that term before. Um, wing bars and wing patches. So what is a wing bar? A wing bar is a lighter or darker color on the tips, a, a contrasting color on the tips of either the median coverts or the secondary coverts. So here you can see this alder flycatcher has um, on the median coverts right here has pale tips that so creates a wing bar. And on the tips of the secondary coverts, as we looked at when we saw this photo a few slides ago, has a wing bar there too. So it has two wing bars, one in the median coverts, one in the secondary coverts. coverts. Likewise with the bay-breasted warbler here, it has a wing bar here on the median coverts, it has a wing bar here on the secondary coverts. Those are wing bars. Um, a wing patch is slightly different from a wing bar in that it's a little bit bigger. And the reason that it's a little bit bigger is because, as you can see on this uh, golden wing warbler, it's not just the tips of the median coverts and the secondary coverts that are colored, it's the whole feather. So this bird has a wing patch that's created by entirely yellow median coverts and entirely yellow secondary coverts. And likewise with the Blackburnian warbler, um, it has a wing patch here in the median coverts because it has some white, white, all white median coverts. And it has a little wing patch here in the secondary coverts where those coverts are all white as well. So that's the difference between a wing bar and a wing patch and why they're, why they're different, why they look different. And then um, the other place where you get a wing patch, it can be in the lesser coverts. And I thought, I think these are both Phil's photos. I'm pretty sure they are. I know this, I know the blue winged teal is, but this is a northern shoveler and this is a blue winged teal. And what you'll notice is that, that the blue of a, that the blue winged teal is named for is actually not in the speculum. The speculum is green. It's in the lesser coverts. All of the lesser coverts on a blue winged teal are blue and that's why it's called blue winged teal. So the lesser coverts are blue. The median coverts are white, which creates a white wing patch and the secondaries are green. So the speculum on a blue winged teal is actually green, not blue. It's the blue and the lesser coverts that makes it a blue winged teal. And if you didn't see anything on these two birds except the wing, look how similar a northern shoveler's wing is to a blue winged teal. The northern shoveler has all blue lesser coverts, white median coverts, green speculum, just like a blue winged teal. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And the other thing that's kind of interesting that um, is, um, I think a lot of people don't realize is that a green winged teal it's called a green winged teal because it has a green speculum or green secondaries, and, but so does a blue winged teal. The blue winged teal's blue is on the lesser coverts as we just talked about, but they both have green specula. And in fact, all the teal in North America, including cinnamon teal, have are really green winged teal because the green is in the same place on the wings on all three of those species. All right. Any questions about any of that before we move to the rear? Anyone, anyone? Okay, so the first thing, uh, was there anybody? No, nope. okay. So the first thing here is to let you know that there is a typo in this drawing. Uh, this right here where it says upper tail covers covers, it should be coverts, coverts, C-O-V-E-R-T-S, there should be a T in that word. Uh, but I wasn't able to, to edit that because it's a, an image that I just captured. So the rear end of the bird is composed of the upper tail coverts, which is often called the rump, and we'll talk about that in just a second here, and all the tail feathers, and tail feathers are called rectrices. Uh, if you have one tail feather, it's a rectrix. If you have two or more, it's rectrices. And don't ask me why it's all Greek to me, because rectrix is a Greek word. And then on the underside of the bird, so on this on this bird, uh, which I don't remember what it is, I think it's I think it's an orchard oriole, but I'm not sure. Uh, these are the upper. This is the upper tail cover that create the rump, and then these are the rectrices or the tail feathers. And then right under the tail 
if you think about a cat bird that has like a rusty chrism, what's called the chrism is the undertail coverts. So that's also all part of the, the rear end of the bird. So a couple of examples that we have here where the tail is helpful in identifying the bird are two sparrows that uh, look very similar. I mean, if you look at these two birds and just look at the color and the patterns and the field marks, the traditional field marks, um, they're pretty similar. But the one thing that you will notice if you look closely is that a savanna sparrow has an extremely short tail. In fact, if you, if you were to flip that up and lay it over the back of the bird, it would only reach about halfway up the back where the, I gotta move a box out of the way here, where the song sparrow has a really long tail. In fact, the length of the tail is about the same as the length of the body. This length of the body is about the same as the length of the tail, um, excluding the head. So tail length is probably one of the best field marks for these two. The savanna sparrow often has yellow in the face, but as you can see from this picture, uh, not always. So. And this is another one uh, I've, I've birded with lots and lots and lots of people who have identified olive sided flycatchers that I think were probably peewees. Because as you see, this, this is the eastern wood peewee on the left, olive sided flycatcher on the right. And what you'll see is they can both have dark vests, you know, dark coloration on, on the sides of the body, on the flanks and the upper breast. And they can have a yellow wash here in the, in the belly and they both kind of have crested heads. But if you look, the length of the tail of this bird is about the same, Rick, is about the same as the length of the body, <laughs> sorry, where the length of the tail on this bird is maybe a third or a fourth of the length of the body. And it gives the olive-sided flycatcher a very off balance, top heavy appearance, like it's gonna fall over because the tail is so incredibly short. So again, a, and this is actually a good field mark for this bird, even if you can't see any color or pattern on it, you can almost identify an olive-sided flycatcher just completely from silhouette, even if it's backlit, just because that tail is so short. So tail length, a really good field mark uh, to look at for many different species. Uh, we talked a little bit about under coverts or chrisms, the, the feathers that are under right under the bird's tail. And here's a good example of where that comes in handy for differentiating two similar species. The cedar waxwing has white undertail coverts that don't quite reach the tip of the tail. The bohemian waxwing has rusty colored reddish undertail coverts that go pretty much all the way to the tip of the tail. So that's, that's a good field mark. I know bohemian waxwings aren't particularly common in Nebraska, but they're pretty common up here in Minnesota. Uh, in northern Minnesota, especially in the winter. And so uh, that's a good way uh, to tell those two birds apart. Okay, other places where the undertail coverts um, or the, the chrism area can be really handy is two uh, warblers that can be easily confused. This is Tennessee warbler on the left and orange crowned warbler on the right. And as you can see, if you were just, if you were just looking at the color of these birds, they both have grayish heads, they both have olive backs, they both have kind of yellowish underparts. But if you look at the Tennessee warbler, it has a white undertail, it has white undertail coverts. The orange crowned warbler has yellow undertail coverts. And this is, this is true most of the time. The one thing you do have to be careful of is in the fall, immature birds, immature Tennessee warblers can have a little bit of a yellowish wash back here. So if you're looking at these birds in the spring, the white undertail coverts and the yellow undertail coverts is a really good field mark. If you're looking at them in the fall, the white undertail covert is good for Tennessee warbler. A really bright yellow, convincing yellow is good for orange crown. But if you get one that's kind of, eh, I'm not sure. And if you can't tell from, you know, looking at the eye or the eyebrow, which is also a field mark for these birds, um, then uh, sometimes it's better in the fall to not call it. And uh, again, sometimes you don't see the head of the bird, right? You don't see, you get a good look at the head, but if you get a good look at those under tail coverts, uh, it really helps you distinguish those two species. Okay, and then the other thing um, we talked about is the fact that upper tail coverts is also called the rump. 
And here are some raptors that we're going to look at, uh, look at their rumps. And hopefully that's, um, hopefully that's not illegal in Minnesota. I, I know it wasn't in Nebraska. I think it's okay to look at a bird's rump in Minnesota. Um, as long as you don't charge a fee for that. So um, these are three species that have uh, white rumps. And I have also birded with people before who have said, oh, look, there's a Northern Harrier. It has a white rump. And this, this is a Northern Harrier, um, a female or an immature bird, or maybe both. And yes, in fact, Northern Harriers do have white rumps. That is true. But you, depending on what kind of a red-tailed hawk you're looking at, red-tailed hawks also have either white, some white, significant amount of white in the rump or the upper tail coverts, and also sometimes in the upper part of the tail itself, giving it an appearance of very much having a white rump. And uh, depending on what color morph it is, like if it's a criters, for example, this can be very white. And also accipiters, uh, both Cooper's hawk and sharp shinned hawk actually have white rumps. And I was out uh, yesterday or the day before, I think it was the day before yesterday, and saw a Cooper's hawk and it was flying away from me and that thing had a very noticeable white rump. So. The, the moral of that story is that uh, every raptor with the white rump is not necessarily a harrier. Although the white rump is a good field mark for the harrier. All right. And then here, of course, we have the infamous, famous, infamous, how, whatever it is, uh, yellow rumped warbler. And um, this is, you know, because of its name, yellow rump uh, is a fairly obvious, uh, fairly obvious thing that it was named for. And I think these, Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think these are both spring pictures. And I would say this is probably a male in the spring and this is probably a female in the spring. Yes, right. Okay. And um, you can see they do, they do have the yellow rump and you can see where the yellow is. You know, it's in the, the lower part of the back and, and the upper tail coverts. But the mess, moral of this message is that every warbler that has a yellow rump is, while that is a good field mark, is not necessarily a yellow rumped warbler because here is a palm warbler and you can see that it in fact has a yellow rump and here is a magnolia warbler and it has a yellow rump and there is a Cape May warbler and it has a yellow rump too. So just because you see a warbler flying away from you and you get a flash of yellow on the rump, you, you can't necessarily assume that it was a yellow rumped warbler. You have to, you have to look a little closer uh, to, make the, to make the final ID. Okay. Everybody still with us? Anybody have any questions at this point? Okay. If you really want to get crazy, um, <laughs> these are the undertails of both the Eastern and Western species of warblers. Uh, and I think there are several different field guides that have, uh, have charts like this. So I guess they can be uh, useful or confusing uh, in terms of identifying warblers, but but this just goes to show you that that you know that the warbler is right straight above your head, and you get a good look at the tail and the and the under tail covered. Sometimes you can tell what it is if you've got all this memorized. All right, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the body of the bird. Um, not not a whole lot on this one. I just have a few slides for this one, but there are some terms here that that we probably want to uh, want to clear up. Uh, I think there's confusion sometimes um, on what is the breast and what is the belly. So the, the breast is all, all of these parts on the lower part of the bird are called underparts. So the, the bird is divided, you know, under parts and, and upper parts. The upper parts are the back and the rump and the nape and the, the top of the bird. The underparts are the parts of the bird that we're primarily looking at here. So on the under part of the bird, the foremost or the part closest to the head is the breast. And then the area kind of like right under the wings are called the sides. And then the, uh, the <laughs> underwing coverts that are closest to the body are called the axillaries. Axillaries, I, I'm not sure if it's pronounced axillaries or axillaries. Mostly I think I hear axillaries. And then the flanks are a little bit farther down uh, more towards the rear of the bird and on the side of the bird. And then the belly is really um, this area below the breast that's that's lower on the on the under part of the bird. And the vent is where the bird, uh, this is where the reproductive organs are, and this is where the bird eliminates, where it goes to the bathroom. So that's the vent right in there. And then as we've already talked about, we have the undertail coverts. So field guides use the term flanks a lot. 
Um, and the flanks, I think it's worth noting again, the flanks are in this area of the bird right, right here. So a couple of um, identifications that, oh, and before, before, sorry, before we move on, the other term that you hear a lot is scapulars. And the scapulars um, are kind of the transition feathers from the back of the bird to the wing. So they kind of cover the, they kind of cover the wing and also protect the joints and the areas where the wing joins to the body. So in the, both of these uh, pictures, the scapulars are the blue feathers. So they're kind of on the back, but they're kind of over the wing. So on a, on a perched bird, they're these feathers right here. And on a bird in flight, they're these feathers right here. And uh, scapulars are often um, noted as something to look at uh, when you're identifying shorebirds, sometimes not only which species you're looking at, but you look at the scapulars to see what the pattern and the, and the wear is to figure out if you've got an adult bird or a young bird, because in shorebirds, a lot of times uh, the plumage is, and the look of the bird is very different if it's an immature bird or if it's a mature bird. So it is important to at least know what, where the scapulars are so that when you are looking at the field guide and you're looking at the bird and they're saying, look at the scapulars, you know what to look at. And so that's, that's what these feathers are right here. Okay, so speaking of scapulars, here is a common um, identification that we sometimes have to make. Spotted towhees are a lot more common in Nebraska than they are in Minnesota, at least in this Eastern Minnesota where, where, uh, where we live, where I live. Um, but we did have a spotted towhee that spent the whole winter here uh, in Dakota County, just south of where I live, which was kind of cool. So if you look at the Eastern towhee, you'll see that it does have some white on it. It has whites, in, it has some white up here in the uh, bend, by the bend of the wing up here. That, I think that's probably the, in the lesser coverts and also in the secondary coverts and also in the primaries, there's a little bit of white. But what differentiates the spotted towhee is the white spots on the scapulars. So these spots that you see right here where the red arrow is pointing, they have those feathers have little white tips and the Eastern towhee just doesn't have that. The back, the back and the scapulars of the Eastern towhee is all black. So you kind of need to know to look in the right spot to figure out if you have a spotted towhee. And likewise with sedge wren and marsh wren, uh, this is another, uh, uh, identification that is often difficult for me if you don't hear the birds sing. If you hear them sing, it's really obvious. But in the rare occasion when the bird pops up and you have about a tenth of a second to look at it, one of the cool thing or not one of the um, best things to look at on a small wren like this are the scapulars because a sedge wren has these little black and white bars on, on its scapulars and the marsh wren doesn't. They're plain. And despite the fact that the spotted sandpiper is called spotted sandpiper, it doesn't have any spots on its back and scapulars. The spotted sandpiper is named for black spots on the underside of the bird that are only present during the breeding season. And in fact, the thing that is the most more spotted than a spotted sandpiper is the solitary sandpiper on the left. And the solitary sandpiper has all of these little tiny white spots on its back and also on its scapulars and also in its primaries and all throughout its wing. This is an immature spotted sandpiper. We're really nice photo, Phil, thank you. Um, but as you can see, it actually doesn't have any spots. It actually has some barring on its scapulars, black barring. Okay, so um, overall size of the body is another thing that, that can be really helpful in determining what species you have. So I'd like you to just kind of take a second. This, this is a lesser yellow legs and a greater yellow legs. And I would just kind of like you to take a second and think about um, which one you think is which, which is greater and which is lesser. I was doing the Sarpy County spring count with, with Deb and Neil Ratzliff a couple of years ago. And we were looking at a yellow legs that was standing in a puddle all by itself, just like kind of like these are. And Neil and I were going back and forth and looking at the bill length and looking at this and looking at that. And if you've ever birded with Neil and me, you know, it's kind of a, <laughs> it's, it's an experience. But anyway, we finally settled on the fact that it was a greater yellow legs. So we were just about to write down greater yellow legs. And all of a sudden, a killdeer flew in and landed right by the yellow legs. And 
the yellow legs was actually a little bit smaller or about the same size as the killdeer and a greater yellow legs would be much larger than killdeer so we changed our immediately changed our vote to lesser yellow legs so if you have a yellow legs that's just standing by itself like this it's often really difficult to tell which one you've got and so size comparison this is by the way this is the lesser yellow legs and this is the greater yellow legs and if you have any disagreement with that at all uh, just a minute, let me get my phone. I'll give you Phil's number. Phil, these are Phil's photos, so you can call Phil and argue with him if you think that's not right. But if you get this kind of a view, this is a little more convincing because here you have a lesser yellow legs with a pectoral sandpiper, and they're about the same size. And here you have a greater yellow legs with a green winged teal. I mean, a greater yellow legs is as big as a small duck. And so when I'm doing shorebirds, that is one of the things that I almost always do first is I look and see, are there any birds out there on the flat that I know what they are? Is there a killdeer? Is there a spotted sandpiper? Is there, you know, a, a green wing teal? Is there a bird that I can use? I know for sure what this bird is and I can kind of use it as a comparison to judge, you know, the size of the other birds that I'm trying to identify. So, so anyway, there you go. Size, uh, size is easier if you got something to compare to. All right, we're coming down to the end here, folks. So um, if you got any questions, let me know. The last thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the bird's head because field guides are continually, uh, you know, saying look for a mallard stripe or look for a mustachial stripe or look for an eye stripe or look at the supercilium. And what in the world does all of that mean? So I don't have a whole lot of examples to show you because I want to spend some time going through this, uh, sl this slide right here because I think you can, you can learn the most important things you need to know from looking at the examples here. So I'm gonna start with the, um, with the photo or the drawing on the left, and we're gonna start at the bill. So first of all, uh, mandible is um, a term that just refers to a part of the bill. So the, the bill is composed of two mandibles. There's an upper, which is basically the upper part of the beak or the bill and the lower mandible, which is a lower part. Um, a lot of people use the words beak and bill interchangeably. What, what I've always heard is that a beak is this, that, that all birds have bills, but some birds, the bill is uh, heavy and sharp and muscular and designed for cracking things open. And that's when it's a beak. So raptors have beaks, cardinals have beaks, parrots have beaks, um, and then all the other ones you refer to as, as bills. So I don't know if that's, um, documented anywhere, but that's what I've always heard is that any of them can be referred to as bills, but a beak specifically is a, a big strong bill. So anyway, you would say, well, why in the world would I ever care about the mandibles? And the answer is, um, and we'll see this in a minute. I think I have a photo of this, if I remember right. Um, American tree sparrows, one of their best field marks is the fact that the upper mandible is not the same color as the lower mandible. The upper mandible is gray, the lower one is yellow. yellow. So actually looking at the bill on a sparrow can be very helpful in determining what, um, what species it is. Right under the lower, lower mandible, right below the bill is the chin of the bird. And the chin is not very uh, big. I mean, the chin is just, I mean, if you think about what our chin is like compared to our neck and our throat, the chin of the bird is really very small. And when we're banding and we catch um, cedar waxwings, that's one of the differentiators between male and female is how much black is in the chin. And what I've learned from looking at those cedar wax wings is that, you know, the difference between a male and a female isn't, you know, it, it isn't a lot, but the females are definitely smaller, the males are definitely bigger. And that whole area that's called the chin is not very big at all because as soon as the chin ends, you get into the throat and the throat is, you know, a much bigger and a much more visible area. So when you're looking at the chin of a bird, you're just looking at a very small area here. If there's, if, you know, if you're looking to see if the bird has a black chin, for example, and the, and the color, the black color is all down in this area, that's also in the throat. It's not just in the chin. Okay, so the mallard stripe uh, is the lowest stripe that borders the throat. It's, it's this one right here that comes right from the very bottom of the bill down, uh, down along the side of the throat. And then the mustachial stripe is the one up, the other black one up here on this photo, on this sketch. Um, and the way I remember the difference between the two is the mustachial stripe is sort of similar to where a mustache would be 
on a person in that it's above the mouth. So the mustachial stripe connects to the top of the bill or above, above the mouth where the malar stripe is below it. So that's just kind of how I can remember which one is which. And then the area between the two is called the submustachial stripe because it's under the mustache. Um, the, the other thing that uh, people are often uh, confused about or use the terms interchangeably or, um, or incorrectly is the difference between an eye line or an eye stripe and a supercilium. So a supercilium is above the eye. It's sort of like maybe our equivalent of an eyebrow, I guess you might say. So the supercilium is up here above the eye and the eye stripe or the eye line, as we'll see on the other photo here or the other picture here in a minute, is the one that comes right out of or goes right through the eye. So the eye stripe or the eye line goes, is at the eye level. The supercilium is above the eye level. And then this particular bird does not have a complete eye line or eye stripe. It just has one behind the eye. Oh, sorry. And that's called a postocular eye stripe because it's only behind the eye. The um, lores are this area right in here between the eye and the bill. And the super laurel is uh, like the, the upper part of that. Then the stripe, if the bird has a stripe right down the very center of its head, that's called a median crown stripe. And then if it has stripes on the side of that, of that stripe, those are called lateral crown stripes. A ring around the eye is called an eye ring. That's one that uh, somebody like me must have named that one because that one, you know, it's pretty simple. Uh, Phil asked me the other day, he sent me an email and he said, so are eye rings um, feather or are they bare parts? And I was like, oh, I should probably know the answer to that, but I didn't. So I did a little research and um, for the most part, eye rings right around the very um, border of the eye uh, are mostly bare skin but sometimes around the edges of them, there's little tiny feathers. And then the more you work out from that, uh, the more feathered they are. And I'll give you, I do have an example that I can show you of that uh, coming up here. Um, and eye rings uh, actually can be useful uh, in identifying birds. Does a bird have an eye ring or does it not? Or can you not tell, which is sometimes the case. Is that an eye ring or is, is that great cheek thrush or is that a swing sense? I don't, I don't know. So sometimes, you know, it's, it is really hard to tell. And other birds like the tufted titmouse have a black eye ring, which isn't something that's really obvious in the field, but they have uh, black skin right around the eye and then they have a row of black feathers around the eye. And it, it, the theory is that it makes their eye look bigger and it makes them look scary or fierce to predators, which I don't think there's any um, exhibitor out there that would be afraid of a titmouse's eye. So I don't know. All right, so just really briefly to go through the other, uh, um, picture here because it does have a couple things that the other one doesn't. Ear coverts. Birds don't have an external ear like we do, but they absolutely have ears. They're just internal and they're covered by feathers. And the ear coverts are back here in this area, which is also called the auricular. And um, you can't, unless you blow the feathers away, you can't see the bird's ear, but, but it's under those ear coverts. This, this bird has a complete eye stripe that goes all the way through the eye. You can see right there. And eye stripe and eye line are interchangeable terms. Um, this one says stripe, this one says stripe, but a lot of field guides will say eye line. And um, I think that is the only thing, the only two things that are different on this, on this picture. Again, the mustachial stripe is right kind of the top part of the bill, like a mustache would be above our mouth. The submustachial is in here, this white area, and then the malar stripe is down low here. Any questions about any of that? Any questions about anything so far? I think I have about five more slides here, uh, five or six more slides that we'll uh, we'll look at some of these field marks can be useful. Rick, yes. Rick somebody asked about cheek patches, and if, so they saw that term in a in a in a field guide, cheek patch. I would is that, is that an, uh, an ear covert? Yeah, I would say most of the time when they're talking about a cheek patch, they're talking about something in the in the auricular area. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've also seen the term, especially with with falcons, with falcon markings, 
the uh, an auricular uh, stripe. Yes, yeah, so like, like on a kestrel or a peregrine falcon. Yeah, that, that would be something that would come down, like in this area. Okay, so it's just a um, the uh, the location. So it so it would uh, right over the ear. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, a bird doesn't have a cheek in the same sense that we do. Really, you make analogies between human characteristics and and bird characteristics, and they're not always you know one to one. And those patches, um, I think I'm going to have you mute again, Bob. Please. Thanks. Those patches that Bob was talking about on the falcons, on the kestrels and the peregrine falcons that are in this area, uh, actually serve. Um, a, per, a useful purpose for them um, because just like football players or baseball players will put um, black under their eyes to reduce glare from the sun, those birds of prey have those dark feathers in and around and under their eyes for the very same reason. So, all right, so moving on, a couple other examples here. All right, why am I not going? There we go. This is uh, the head of the, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get my, there's some, some really nice things about uh, doing these presentations remotely and there are some really uh, annoying things about doing these presentations remotely. Moving things around on the screen is one of them. Uh, so this is the head of a song sparrow. And uh, the reason I put this picture in is because a song sparrow is one that is just like the classic example of pretty much everything we just talked about because in fact, I think, Probably this bird, if you had to say what it was, probably is a song sparrow. Maybe it's a white throat, but anyway, the song sparrow has the malar mark. It has the submustachial sub stripe. It has the mustachial stripe. It has the postocular eye line. It has uh, doesn't really have an eye ring, although it does have a little pale around the ring of the eye. It has a later uh, um, a median crown stripe. It has a lateral crown stripe. It has a paler supercilium. So it's just uh, song sparrow is a really good bird to just show a, a real example of all the things that we just talked about. Okay, so here is um, here are a couple of, of examples of uh, useful uh, field marks on birds that we're going to be seeing here in the next few weeks, and how looking at the head and the field marks on the head can help. We have a warbling vireo on the left. It has a uh, pale uh, throat and the lores, the area between the eye and the bill are mostly pale, where the Philadelphia vireo, which, which looks very much like a warbling vireo, has a yellow throat, and this is sort of a pale yellow. They can be, I mean, the, the amount of yellow can vary quite a bit, but it's usually pretty noticeable that it's yellow. And they also have this complete eye line, which gives them a dark appearance here in the lores. Um, these are two, uh, in fact, the, um, I was going to say there's going to be showing up soon, and that's no kidding because we had a northern water thrush reported um, in the cities here today, which is really pretty early for a northern water thrush up here. Louisiana water thrushes are not very common here or in Nebraska, but along the Missouri River and some places along the Platte, I know Louisiana water thrushes breed every year. And there are a few places up here where if you go and look and listen, you can find Louisiana water thrush. And people often talk about, you know, the the um, shape and the length and the and all of that of this supercilium, and they talk about the color of the flanks, and there are a lot of field marks that you know that people look at for water thrushes, which is good. But the one I always look at first is is the chin and the throat, because a Louisiana water thrush has a plain white chin and throat, usually, and a northern water thrush has a streaked chin and throat, so. Uh, if, if the bird, especially if the bird is singing and it has its head up, or if you're under the bird and looking up, if you can see that throat and that chin, that's that's a pretty good field mark. And also, of course, just want to uh, have a uh, uh, just a thank you to Roland Barth, who of course is no longer with us, but Roland took a lot of really good photographs and of course collaborated with Neil on the two books at Fontenelle Forest. And uh, I'm just happy to have one of his photos in the presentation tonight. And uh, Hope he's watching from somewhere tonight. So uh, we, I kind of briefly mentioned the gray cheeked and the Swainson's thrush. Um, this is uh, a case where you want to look around the eye. You want to look for that eye ring. And on the case of the Swainson's thrush, which is the bird on the right, 
uh, it's not just the eye ring, it's also what's, what's called uh, in a lot of field guides a spectacle. And uh, I know I've made a spectacle of myself when I've been birding many times. And this, <laughs> Swainson Suresh is making a spectacle of himself because the spectacle refers to an eye ring accompanied by um, a pale stripe in the area of the lowers and the place you know where the eye line would be. And for the most part, to go back to Phil's question that he asked me earlier this week, the very edge around the dark eye is going to be pale skin. But as you move away and get out here into the spectacle part of, in the lowers, that's going to be pale feathers as opposed to bare skin. And then you can see here on the gray cheek thrush that it lacks a distinct eye ring and the whole face, including the area of the lowers is a really dark gray or pale gray, or a, I mean, a, a, sorry, a solid gray. And my experience in distinguishing these two species is that if you're not sure, it's probably a Swainson's thrush because when you see a gray cheek thrush, you know, you know, it's like the difference between a downy and a hairy. I'm not sure it's almost always a downy because when you see a hairy, you go, oh yeah, that's a hairy. And my experience has been that if I'm not sure, the closer I look and the more I study the bird and if I get a photo of it, it almost always turns out to be a Swainson's thrush. And this, this is a good one for um, any time of the year, not, you know, not just breeding season. In fact, it's probably more useful, for sure more useful in the winter than, than in the breeding season. But this is um, chipping sparrow and clay colored sparrow. And of course, in the spring and the summer, the chipping sparrow has the rusty crown, the reddish you know, uh, crown. Uh, but we don't see that in the fall and the winter, and we don't see that in young birds either. They don't, the hatchier birds uh, don't have the, um, the rusty crown yet. So um, what do you look at to distinguish chipping sparrow from clay colored sparrow? Because if you look at these two birds, uh, most people would tell you they're probably the same species. I mean, most inexperienced or non-birders would say, I don't see a difference. And the key difference is the eye line. And we talked before about the postocular eye stripe and the complete eye stripe. Chipping sparrow has a complete eye stripe. So from the eye to the bill, there's a little black line there. And clay colored sparrow has only a postocular eye stripe. It doesn't have the eye stripe between the eye and the bill. And that's a, that's a really handy field mark. Now, if you live out in Western Nebraska and you've got brewer sparrow, then uh, we don't wanna talk about that. And that's it. We did it. We made it. Did I come even close to the time? Look at that, 54 minutes. No, probably more than that. Anyway, doesn't matter. What kind of questions do people have? I'll just make a statement here. This, this is a great presentation because I've always been too lazy to go back <clears throat> and learn all of the parts of the bird. But it, when you put it in perspective like this, it, it, it shows you the importance of, of, of lear learning bird anatomy and, and the importance of studying each part of it to just to distinguish birds. Well, thanks, Bob. Then, then I'm going to tell you that the idea was this was really my idea, not Phil's, to do this present. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Okay, thanks, Phil. Yeah, if you, just, if you just like it, it was all fair. Right I, <laughs> I love it. Actually, this was Phil's idea. He was the one who said, hey, wouldn't it be cool to do a presentation like this? I, think. I guess I don't know. Was it cool? I don't know. But yeah. And of course, Phil provided some beautiful photos here, as you saw. Do you want... I, I don't know if Pam Albin is on tonight from here, but I know Pam met Phil on a, on a, Pam is one of our banders, one of the people who helps us with banding, and she met Phil in California on a pelagic trip, which I thought was really crazy, but, and she said what a nice guy he was, and I said, did, did he tell you that he's one of the most accomplished bird photographers in the country? He said, no, he didn't, he didn't mention it. I said, well, he's also really humble, but Phil, how, how, how many photos, how many birds have you photographed in, uh, in North America? Uh, 726, something like that. Yeah, and do you, where, do you know where you are on the list now? Uh, I, well, I've stayed still while these young bucks have gone by me, so I'm by like number 13 or 14. In another couple of years, I'll be off the list completely. <laughs> well, we'll still bird with you because we like you. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. But that, that's really something. That's, you know, in the, in the whole, because it's, I suppose it's people, it's suppose it's in the whole world because people come from other countries to photograph here, so. Sure. Yep. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. Rick, uh, Elizabeth uh, Chalen's on, whom you know. 
I saw uh, she, a lovely face. Yeah, and she, I'm losing her question here. I'm trying to find it. If you want to, if you want to unmute, Elizabeth and ask Rick, you can sure do it here. I, I saw it come by and I'm trying to trying to get it back here. She went. Oh, I didn't have a question. I just said that I'm it's thank goodness that Phil had this idea for you, Rick. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, you know when we work together, you had all the ideas, Elizabeth. So I'm I'm used to working with, with the idea people. Well, uh, you take you take credit for for that stuff really well. <laughs> oh god. It looks like we're it looks like we cleared the questions here. All right. I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Catherine Cooper. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Rick. I actually have an observation, um, and it just happened today. I was at the forest working in the archive room, and I came across a, a bird survey done in 1944 by the NOU, and I was surprised. They, it was nesting birds. They, they noted three yellow-breasted chats nesting in the forest. And the other bird, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That might be me, I'll turn it off. That's me. The other, I'm sorry, the other bird that used to nest in Fontenelle Forest that is hardly ever seen in Nebraska anymore is blue-winged warbler. I don't know if that was on the list you saw or not, but I remember seeing that on some old lists too. There were some, um, Cerulean's. Yes. Yep. And of there were eight oven bird nests. Yeah. I was I, I was just quite surprised at that. Anyway, it was was fun to look at. And thanks very much, Rick. I appreciated this. Oh, thank you. Okay, anybody else? It looks like um, Kathy had a question asking if about the difference between speculum and partials. Well, that's a good question. And I'll have to go back and look. I don't know if a speculum usually includes partials or not. Oops. Uh, I think, I think it looks to me, I'm, I'm looking at the screen. We, uh, can you see my screen? I suppose you can. Uh, let's do this. It looks to me like these are the tertials in here and that they're not part of the speculum. That's based on this photo, that's what I would say. Does that answer the question? Thanks for catching that, Elizabeth. Hey, Rick. Hi, it's Kathy. I was just confused because they seemed in such a similar position. Well, the tertials are the three innermost secondaries. Yeah. So the tertials are part of the secondaries. That is correct. But I think if I'm, if I'm looking at this green wing teal, person, I think that these are the tertials up in here and I think they're not green, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet my, <laughs> my month's salary on that. Well, I guess I said I'm retired, but, but okay. I, don't, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. All right. Kathy's, Kathy is one of our uh, banders up here. And Kathy's, you want to take 30 seconds and talk about your mom, Kathy? Because she was like one of the pioneer bird banders in Minnesota, right? Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. My mother was Janie Oliphant, and she banded 84,000 birds with her own two hands and no team. She had no other recorder or extractors besides herself. And she did all this in 46 years, as well as raised three children and taught school kids about birds. And she also, um, you know, she mentored, she mentored some folks, including our very own Jim Fitzpatrick, um, how to, how to band. Yep. So yeah, yeah, she was kind of a tour de force. That's incredible. This is Bob. You know, one of you guys could move back down here, Rick, if you want to. And <laughs> other than Joel, we're kind of we're just kind of stuck for bird banders down here. You know, it's a whole different world up there. I, I can't mm -hmm. believe we have, and especially with COVID now, the executive director at the Nature Center where I volunteer has to schedule people. You know, because there are too many people to help every week with bird banding, and they're just one of the band, many banding sites up here. There's Lots and lots of vendors up here. It's really crazy. 
older really, but older. Mm -hmm. We really, really are, are having a, kind of a dearth. You used to kind of pick up most of the slack, but it's uh, we, we're few and far between now. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have a crazy enthusiastic bird banding team. That is for sure. It's a ton. Of, yeah, and we had a lot of fun. I mean, I had a great team of volunteers to help me. We were like the only show in town. I don't think there were any other active vendors in Nebraska when I was banding. So, yeah, not very many anyway. Of course. Well, are we out of questions? Or let me look one more time in the chat box here and see. If anybody has a question at this point, feel free to unmute and just chime in. Okay. Somebody asked about the recording and yes, we have it recorded. So if, if you came in late or if you know somebody who'd be really interested in this program, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and ASO has a, has a, uh, or YouTube and then the ASO channel, it'll, it'll be available to watch. So it looks like we, we got the questions out, Rick. I think you did a pretty good job of explaining. And, I, and again, I really do appreciate the, the way you taught this. Is, is, I was incredibly lazy about learning <clears throat> bird parts and that kind of thing when I got back into birding. Well, you're very welcome. I hope it was helpful and useful. And, and yeah. uh, I hope to see you all again soon. Great. Well, I think we'll call it to the end. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. And thanks to the folks that came down with Rick from Minnesota, so it really was a nice program. I appreciate it. And if you Thank need to do it, sign on to YouTube. Thanks, guys. Hi. Hi. Great job, Rick. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.